This morning, if you will go with me, go to 107th Psalm. 107th Psalm. Everyone I trust had a good Thanksgiving day. Plenty to eat. Amen. To be, and you're thankful, not only just Thanksgiving Day, but every day. You're thankful. The Bible says in the 107th Psalm, in verse 22, And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. There are several portions of Scripture in the psalm. Psalm 100 and Psalm 92, Psalm 106. I just... Many, many places we could look at verses of thanksgiving. The psalmist was thankful. David was thankful. David was thankful, of course, for mercy. David was thankful for grace. He was thankful for God's provision all through his life. You can look at some of the psalms of Asaph, and he was the same way. Everyone that picked up the pen and wrote under the inspiration of God was thankful. was a very thankful individual, thankful people. Paul was thankful. Paul understood what mercy and grace was. Paul, um, of course, persecuted the church. He said he did it ignorantly. On the road to Damascus, a light came down from heaven. The voice spoke, and Paul was never the same. He went about the rest of his life talking about mercy and grace, the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare his works with rejoicing. That's exactly what he did. Brother Dewey did a good job Wednesday night, if you were here. He brought out some things um, about the sacrifices of thanksgiving. If you'll notice... In Leviticus, in Leviticus, um, as I was studying my message for this coming Sunday, um, I thought, my, my, I hope he don't preach at all. Yeah, but he, uh, he got some of it. But you can't, you just can't, you can't get enough of it. Amen. You can't get enough of Thanksgiving and, and the blessings of God. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 7, now we're talking about um, sacrifices of thanksgiving. There were special sacrifices in the Old Testament for thanksgiving. Not uh, just for sin, but a special sacrifice for thanksgiving. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 12, um, if he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with a sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. Now, look at Leviticus chapter 22. Leviticus chapter 22. And verse number 29. Leviticus chapter 22, verse 29. The Bible said, And when you will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord, offer it at your own will. Offer it at your own will. Our text in Psalm 107 and verse number 22, and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. When a person really experiences the grace and mercy of God, he just can't help but rejoicing and begin giving thanks to Almighty God. One preacher said this, he said, the loveliest flower that blooms in the garden of the heart is the flower of gratitude. And when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, he is well nigh gone. I believe that's true. Take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter number 1. Everyone following with me, please. Romans chapter 1. I hope I'm going slow enough to get you there. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1, the Bible says in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. You see, the truth can be known, and it is known. That Verse 19 verifies that statement I just made, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Um, 
the Bible says in verse number 19, they begin to hold the truth in unrighteousness. It ended up in verse 25 as they changed the truth. They held the truth in unrighteousness. And in verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. I give an illustration about driving down the interstate. Um, the speed limits, well, back in the 70s, you remember it went down to 55. That was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life, especially if I was driving on the interstate. And so... Um, um, I'm confessing more times than not I would go over the speed limit and every once in a while I would see the blue lights in my rear view mirror. My heart would go down in my sock and I would say, oh, it's me. Well, sure enough, after he got there, are you in a hurry? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know you were speeding. Yes, sir. So I get the ticket. And I get the ticket and I grumble under my breath and I put the ticket in my pocket and I go home and I send the, the monies into the proper place to send it. But you know, even after it's all said and done, we appreciate the speed limit. It saves lives. It saves lives. I, I might not respect it all that I should, but I still appreciate it. I still appreciate it because there's some boundaries God's established and so I violated it. I violated it. I violated the standard. But repudiation is when I don't like that speed limit sign and I pull over to the side of the road and I put my car in park and I get it out and I tear the sign up and I throw it in the ditch and I replace it with another one. That's repudiation. That's repudiation. You see, that's exactly what men have done with the Word of God. They held the truth in unrighteousness, and the further they went, they changed the truth of God into a lie. We violate the law, though we appreciate the law. But men has went as far as repudiation. Look at verse 19 again. Of Romans chapter 1. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. No man can ever stand before a holy God and say, I didn't know. The Bible said you're without excuse. The Bible even says that what was needed to be known was manifest in you, that God put light in you. How do I know that? Well, not only does Romans say that, but John chapter 1 and verse number 9 says that he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I know that to be true. It's what he says. I believe the Word of God. This is our standard. This is not something we play with, either if uh, it's true or it's not true. And you need to make your mind up. If God said it, I'm going to believe it. God lighted every man that comes into the world. What may, may be known of God is manifest in you, is what the Bible says. We act upon that light. God begins to give us more truth. Now, this matter of the Godhead, the Bible says here in Romans chapter 1, that the things which are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's a verse that I want to couple with that verse, and I find it in Colossians chapter 2. Just listen to this verse. In verse 9, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible said, For in Him, that is in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God is one God. He is one Lord. Jesus Christ is God. Romans chapter 1 said that we know these things. Why? Because not only is we have the light, but we have creation itself. We have a conscience in Romans chapter 2. If you'll just glance across the page there at Romans chapter number 2 and verse number 14 and 15. 
The Bible said, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. God has given you a conscience. A conscience is not our standard, but the conscience applies the standards. The Word of God is our standard. And the Word of God says that creation in Romans chapter 1 tells us that there is a creator. The conscience in Romans chapter 2 tells us there's a creator and a savior. In Romans chapter 3 and verse number 2, we have the oracles of God that tells us there's a creator. Amen? So we see that. Man is without excuse. Now look at verse 21 of Romans chapter 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I stop there and I'm reminded of Exodus chapter 32 and 33. Moses was in the mountain getting the law and he heard a noise in the camp and he came down and he found that everyone had taken the gold off of their necks and out of their ears and their earrings and cast them into the fire and Aaron came out with a calf. And he said, this be your gods, worship them. And they were dancing and having all kinds of parties in the absence of Moses. Well, the question comes up, how could a people who saw the, the Shekinah glory of God, and how could people that experienced the power of God, how could they create an image so unlike God? Well, they knew God, but yet the Bible says here in Romans chapter number one, they changed the glory of God, or the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You know what men wants? Men wants a loose-lipped God that will allow conformity to sin. But God is holy. God is holy and God is just. They changed the glory of God. Now the Bible said because of this, in verse 24, that God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. God gave them up. He did not give them up in the sense that you're doomed and damned for an eternity in the pit of fire, and the lake of fire, but he gave them up to their own thinking. And you know what the Bible says about a man's own thinking in Proverbs chapter 12 and also Proverbs chapter 14? It said, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The worst form of judgment that God could ever pronounce on an individual or on a family or on a country is to let man have his own way. Right. Why? Because men have are born and shapen in iniquity and in sin. David said, did my mother conceive me? Go over, if you will. We looked at this a little bit last night. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. What I'm, what I'm saying this morning is that we ought to have a thankful heart. If you'll notice, all of the downward progression started in Romans chapter 1 when men became unthankful. Gratitude ought to be prevalent. Now, gratitude is not a natural thing. It's, it's not. It's an unnatural thing. Again, the Bible talks about our nature in Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Are you in Ephesians chapter 2? Ephesians chapter 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, 
We're in time past. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Let me stop reading right there. And we find that man, of course, is going about his own way, his own course. He's under a wrong control. We talked about it last night. He's under the wrong conduct. He fulfills the desire of the flesh. It's his nature to be unthankful. It's his nature to be unthankful. But the Bible said that God has lighted every man. You see, when Adam fell and Adam brought sin into the world, in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. When Adam brought sin in the world, man, of course, that image was not eradicated. That image was marred, that image of God. God said he created man in his own image. That image was marred, but there's still light. How do I know there's still light? Because God said so. It's in them. It's manifest in them, is what the Bible says. What may be known of God is manifest in them. It's manifest from the creation of the world through creation. It's manifest through the conscience that God has given you. We know this. We know that. So that image is marred. But what we need to do now as parents in this time of thanksgiving, and this time of thanksgiving should be a lifetime, is we tell our children to be thankful, to be thankful. You see, thankfulness, again, is not a natural thing. Um, this little boy, I've, I think I've given the story before, this little boy received a piece of cake from this nice lady, and he said, thank you, ma'am. And... Uh, he said, if you'll give me some ice cream to go on it, I'll say it again. <laughs> you see, we tell our children, now you say thank you, you say thank you, and we know that children have to be taught to say thank you. They just receive everything without saying. So when they get older and they're ready to make a decision concerning Christ, they'll see where they came from and they'll be thankful. They'll realize what God has done for them. If you'll notice in Ephesians chapter 2 while you're still there, but God, and I love the but gods in the Bible. I, I really do. I, I thank God that things do change. But now God, the Bible said, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Look in verse 13 of Ephesians 2. But now, but God, but now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And the Bible says in verse 6 and 7 that he has raised us, God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Not only should we be thankful uh, for all of the material possessions. We're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful to God for Christ, for in Christ is our salvation. In Christ is eternal life. And then we have uh, that salvation received in verse 8 and 9. The Bible said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, all through the Bible, the Bible tells us that salvation is by grace and mercy. Drop my glasses. Salvation is through grace and mercy, only by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Salvation is, is, uh, can never be earned. There's nothing in us that could ever merit audience with God. So we say the word grace. Grace means God's unmerited favor. But mercy and grace go together. They're together. The Bible tells us that. I believe it's in um, Psalm um, 80, 85. Psalm 85. 
The Bible said mercy and grace go together and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. I, I think that's the way the latter part of that verse goes. But I do know the first part said mercy and grace is together. Mercy is God not doing to us what we deserve. God not doing to us what we deserve. We deserve to go to hell. Mercy carries with it the idea of pity as well. God pities us, so God shows His grace in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a whole human race that has not one ability to gain audience with a holy God. So God became a man, and He went to Calvary, and on Calvary, Jesus Christ satisfied a debt that you and I could never pay. Jesus Christ paid a wage uh, that satisfied God. Why could not we pay it? It's because God required perfection. And you're just not perfect. You're, I don't care how good you think you are. God requires perfection. And we have nothing to offer God. So God Himself, the holy, perfect, just God, became a man and satisfied his own demands. Salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then we see right there in verse number 11 of Ephesians chapter 2, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called a circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Now think about it. Think about it. In times past. And then we put the times past with the but nows. And we look in verse number 12 and we see that times past, we were without Christ. We were without citizenship. We were without covenant blessings. But verse 13, let me read it again. But now, those first two words. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Why? Because verse 14 says, Jesus is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself twain of one new man, so making peace. Verse 16, reading is better than preaching. I'm going to say something about it. But verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. On Calvary, the person of Christ, God in the flesh, was on Calvary paying that debt. He suffered a beating, cruel beating. He went to Calvary. He was His flesh hanging off of Him. The Bible said His bones were staring at Him, meaning that that cat of nine tails had taken the skin to the bones. He, he suffered and he bled. He shed his blood for our sins. He was put in a tomb and he rose again. There at Calvary, there was two things that we need to get a hold of this morning before I close. And we're so, when you see it, you'll never be ungrateful. Especially for the work of Christ. But when you see there that day, that reconciliation was made. That which was between God and myself, God took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. The enmity that was between man and God was taken out of the way and nailed to His cross. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us was taken out of the way and nailed to His cross. Everything, your, your transgressions, all of your sins. How do I know that? Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in 
Christ. Verse 19 of that same chapter says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not, not, a little word not, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. If God Almighty is not going to impute to you your trespasses, God's not the grandfather figure that says, oh, I'll just let it go. Will God clear the guilty? Two times in the Old Testament, he says he will not clear the guilty. You know what God did? He took all of your condemnation and your punishment and he took it out of the way and he says, I'm going to put it right here. Did you know not only his body was made an offering for sin. This is something to think about. Isaiah 53 said his soul was made an offering for sin. And that day God judged Christ for your sin. And then he tells the whole world that you can go to heaven because of Christ. You can go to heaven only because of Christ. So when you think about mercy, you now mercy has a new meaning, doesn't it? Mercy is God not doing to us what we deserve. And in that idea of mercy comes pity and there's an idea, if you will read all about mercy in the Bible, there's an idea of having the provision to meet what God has said He would do. I'll never forget, a fellow was real hungry and we didn't, he came by the church and um, I said, well, I don't have any food here at the church. But I said, if you will go to this particular place, I said, you can eat everything you want. I said, I'll call ahead and you can eat everything you want. And he said, I sure appreciate it. He said, I'm starving to death. So we sent him, I sent him, the church did, to the restaurant. And I called ahead and the waitresses there were waiting on him and the cook was waiting on him. And he came in and they, start, they got the menu and it was simple. It was just simple stuff. Well, the reason I know that, let me give you the rest of the story. Um, the waitresses called back and said, Brother Rowan said, said he came by. I said, well, did you feed him good? And you could see the, the shakiness in her voice. They were, waitresses were feeling sorry for him and giving him their tips, you know. And he says, we tried to get him to eat and he ordered just a meager meal. I thought, oh my soul. Someone showed pity on him he went to the restaurant and he just got a meager meal. What, what's the crux of that story? God's telling you to come to the supper table and you can have it all. You can have, why don't you accept the mercy of God? You can have it all. You can have it all. I can have the, from the turkey to the broccoli casserole to the corn casserole to the mashed potatoes to the green beans to the carrot cake to the apple pie, to the, what else did we have? I mean, what, I mean, you name it. I can have it all. And you know what I did? I got it all. I got it all. Still suffering, but I got it all. My friend, the mercy of God, He wants you to have it all. God do, does not want to do to you what you deserve. And he did it to Christ so you could be free. You know what that is? That's grace. That's grace. Mercy and grace have come together. Be careful. When your mind goes off of what Christ has done, a man starts to degenerate. He starts to go down. It all started in Romans chapter 1 when they were not, not, not thankful. Amen. Let's stand our feet, please.
Dear Lord, we thank you for your mercy and goodness and grace. Your long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I thank you for that promise. I thank you for the truth of the Word of God. I thank you for the payment that Christ made for our sins that satisfied God. Help us, Lord, everyone here.